this summer. Next summer will be four programs, but we're the third one. Of course, next week, we'll be talking about next week, there'll be something else. Uh, but for now, we want to get started, and for our devotional today, we want to welcome Sharon Welker, and we are blessed in this community to have Jody and Sharon, who have moved here full time, so... Well. Hello, I am so glad to be with you to connect as a member of Montreat Presbyterian Church, living in Black Mountain full time now, which is wonderful. Um, and I'm so glad to be here today. A connection I want to share is with my granddaddy, Fred McAllister, because in addition to being a fine gentleman and a wonderful Presbyterian minister, the iconic story is of our, how much he loved trains. So I look forward to Ron and Caitlin's telling us more about trains and Montreat. So my first connections to Montreat were coming from Huntsville, Alabama to visit grandmother and granddaddy when they were hosts in the Mecklenburg house. And I think it was on Texas. And as a child, it was a long way to the post office, but I think it was just in the way out building. <laughs> so down there. Um, but Granddaddy is one of those Presbyterian ministers who um, bridged denominations. He was um, ordained with ARP, he served the Northern Church as mission work in Kentucky, and he served PCUS in churches in North and South Carolina. But his train connection started as a little boy in Iva, South Carolina. The stories are as a five-year-old, he trudged along the tracks picking up coal to earn a little money. He, um, as a I guess elementary, middle school, he kept a little notebook and recorded boxcar numbers. And when he visited his in-laws in Union, South Carolina, and the train blew, he'd step out and watch the train and sometimes say he recognized some of the boxcars. So Montreat is so special for those kinds of connections of, that transcend time and place. And that's certainly our connection with our Lord who calls us and transcends time and place. So I'm going to share um, from Eugene Peterson's The Message Version, Psalm 148, verses 1 through 6. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh from heaven. Praise him from the mountaintops. Praise him, all you his angels. Praise him, all you his warriors. Praise him, sun and moon, and praise him, you morning stars. Praise him, high heaven. Praise him, heavenly rain clouds. Praise, oh, let them praise the name of Yahweh. He spoke the word, and there they were. He set them in place from all time to eternity. He gave his orders, and that's it. So let us pray as grateful people who've been set in this time and place today and as we seek to transcend eternity with our Lord. Heavenly Lord, we join in praise to you for your mighty works, for creating this amazing world and calling us to worship, learn, and serve as your beloved children. Amen. Thank you, Sharon. So today we're in for a treat, uh, not the first of the summer, but this is a treat. Um, I've known Ron Vinson for a really long time. Um, when the Historical Foundation closed, which was very sad, um, Ron Vinson was around and everybody picked up the pieces working together <clears throat> and created something wonderful and magical uh, out of sadness and loss. And that's how it goes. That's typical. So I got to know him when 
The room mostly was bare over there, and if you've been to the Presbyterian Heritage Center, you know it is beautiful, imaginative, creative. Well, that came from Ron. He didn't come into a museum and take over. He came in and created it, and it's beautiful. Uh, he and I have been co-conspirators upon occasion where we are, yeah, we could do this, yeah, 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 we could do that, that'd be great, yeah, yeah. And you know, then we'd get brought down to reality when this costs this, this costs that. So we like that kind of thought process. A lot of those things, however, come into being. He comes up with things, you wonder where they came from, and it's just in that brain somewhere. You don't know. And then he's got a cohort today, Caitlin Powell, who is a Wheaton graduate in archaeology. So you've seen a few archaeological uh, artifacts around. And so we're glad to have both of them here to share the magic. in trouble when I have metal in me. Uh, when Judy and Ron get together, people shake. You know, they never know what's going to happen. Uh, how many, before we get started, I want to get a, a little better picture of everyone's understanding. How many of you know something about the Mount Mitchell Railroad? I'm not going to ask Bill McCaskill, I'll ask somebody else. What do you know about it? The railroad ran around the top of Montreal. Ran around the top of Montreal. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I remember my uh, <coughs> uncle Mike Wiley growing up here saying that he had to sometimes go in the middle of the night to help put the mountain out to uh, quench the fire because it would go around the curve and the coals would fall out and set the mountains on fire. So they had to volunteer for me to go. Very nice. Anybody else? Well, uh, did you bring anything from the Mount Mitchell Railroad? There's a prize if you did. You get more uh, dessert. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a good place to rest when you go up and work out. <laughs> it's a good place to rest. Well, we brought an interesting item that we don't know what it is. <laughs> so I want to show it to you because uh, you get a chance to make up a story about it and at the end of the presentation we'll see who has the most creative story. But uh, it's one of those things that came, it's just like we're not sure uh, where it came from and, and how it looked. Uh, one of the things we do when we are at a loss is turn to other museums and try and find out information they have. We received two pieces of ironwork from the Mount Mitchell Railroad two years ago. And we weren't sure exactly what they were. We sent out a notice and uh, John Hinkle did it. And it went to the Tennessee Valley Railroad Museum and they looked back and said, oh yes, that's a rail claim. And I called them and said, what the hell is a rail claim? <laughs> And they told us that it was where they would take a skidder or a loader, clamp it to the train, which was then clamped to the rail, and then pick up logs and put them into the carts, etc. Well, this was found last year. There are still pieces of the Mount Mitchell Railroad that are up there on the mountains. And um, we sent out an inquiry, and nobody has come up with it. So. Uh, like I say, if we can't find out something, we'll invent it. Uh, how many of you have a railroad spike that sits in your cottage here in Montreal? It's something that is there and people can take a look at it. And uh, I just bring this in because there's still things that people are being discovered in if you're eight years old. This is cool, and if you're 80, this is cool, because it's about 125 years old or so. Um, what do you want to know about the Mount Mitchell Railroad 
when you leave this room? Anyone got a specific piece of information they're looking for? Yes. Uh, I, just came, I just came down from walking around that from uh, lookout and down to the threshold. And uh, I was, uh, my question was, what happened to the railroad ties? I assumed that they were discarded when the, when the car uh, toll road was made, but uh, it must have been just uh, locked off the mountain. But you don't see the main places. I'll make a note. Tires, we'll get to that. Anybody else? Yeah. What, was the, what, was the, what were the purposes of the railroad? Timber, tourism? All right. I wanted to know uh, how much it cost to, uh, to get a ticket there. I wanted to know when it was rerouted. To understand they rerouted it from outside of the ridge, so it wouldn't be too much fire from the side. And uh, also understood they had the uh, Stone masons that worked on, um, this one was true or not, stone masons that worked on the Biltmore also did some of the uh, bridges or some of the, some of the supports for the railroad. All right. That's true. Those are all good subjects, and we will try and answer all of those questions. If we don't, we'll return your money. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone said to me, how did this display get started? And the guilty party is Bill McCaskill. Please stand up. <laughs> Bill was in the trains, and I came to Montreat, and I had been in the trains previously. We both had done HO work, and I started talking about, well, let's have a Montreat Train Society. <laughs> we never got around to that. <laughs> But what we did do is get something going, and uh, we decided that we tried to find anniversary dates for many of our exhibits. We try to have some history of Western North Carolina. We try to have uh, some information on the church and missions worldwide, and some of those are milestones that you reach, uh, 500th, 400th, 100th anniversary, and some are just of interest. Well. A couple of years ago, we got decided that we would take a look at the Mount Mitchell Railroad. And the Mount Mitchell Railroad was at that time 110 years old. And that's 2021. It started in 2019. And I want to thank a couple of people before we get going on this because uh, it's too easy to forget to give proper uh, acknowledgement of people who have helped you. And we had many people who helped us on this uh, particular project. Uh, Joe and Mary Stannard and their various books on Montreat have done a great original research. Uh, we have people who teach at uh, the Rhodes Scholars uh, and McCallum's and, and, and spread information about railroads. Uh, Bill McCaskill operated as our railroad guru and most important to me, the electrical engineer, and he still is doing repairs uh, on the uh, model we have. Caleb Powell uh, came to us with a history major in uh, Mount Montreal College and then got the archaeology uh, degree and master's. But she has, I made her do things that she didn't study in college. <laughs> you would say that. And that included uh, doing dioramas. And one of the things, if you were around a number of years ago, about five years ago, we built a trench for a World War I exhibit in the library. Now, when I had a staff meeting and they said, what's going on in the next exhibit? I said, well, we're gonna do a World War I exhibit. We're gonna have a trench in the library. And Lucy Dustheimer said, do I call the people now to come get you or do I wait to see what you have in my mind? But Kaylin had the task of building the trench. And that included putting things together, making uh, sandbags look right, uh, making World War I barbed wire out of uh, sprayed leather. Uh, so we had the right motive. Uh, she would have to do the structure that we built. And uh, it was actually pretty good. And uh, Ann and I, she had to crawl under this to do it. And so we got a, uh, on one of our trips, we got a bird cage and a canary. So we put it in there in case you ran into problems in mining. <laughs> but when we decided to do this, I said, well, let's put together what we uh, 
can talk about and we turn to people in our staff and in the community and in addition to uh, Caitlin and myself and Bill McCaskill, Jason Nance probably did the greatest favor for us. He is your ranger uh, who runs the Nature Center and basically the Presbyterian Heritage Center archives did not have any material uh, except for some pictures about the railroad. We had no artifacts. So I convinced Jason to uh, go through what he had picked up over the years, and that's where many things came from, uh, from the archive standpoint. Kitty Fouché painted and weathered buildings. So you just can't do a, a, a scale model and not weather it and not have it look as, as realistic as you can. Lucy Dustheimer did her, she's a good painter by the way, she did many things, including painting rocks. I'm not sure that's going to go on the resume, but... Um, <laughs> and then we had people searching for things, and we'll t talk to you about some of the things we found. And Lisa Harrell and uh, Nancy Midget both did that. And then Mimi Harrell, uh, Helms did uh, additional things, tracking things for us. Now, we talked about doing a model, but we also talked about how can we be and utilize the best in education. Museum educators have found, particularly over the last 15, 20 years, that if you add a multimedia or an interactive moment for the visitor, the knowledge and enthusiasm spikes, and individuals remember what they see, and they also get a better and deeper affiliation with the subject. And that's good, I think. So what we did was we tried to uh, build some of that into this model. And we also worked on trying to do our little market research. For example, the only model trains and major setups is Hendersonville, which has a model society that is obviously south of Asheville. The Biltmore Estate occasionally does things with trains in one of the rooms out there. But it doesn't, it's not up all the time, and it happens often as you get nearer to the holidays. And we found that many people use the holidays to go to trains to take grandchildren and children to. And uh, it, because there's some echoing memory of trains and they just watch the circle and the train go around. So we've discovered that, what was that, our finding? There was no model railroad facility in North Asheville. There was none in East Asheville, which is where we're located. So we decided that doing the Mount Mitchell Railroad, which is a railroad of great interest to people because it only lasted 10 years. And People come all the time. Brighton, will you teach courses on this at the uh, Road Scholars? What do you find about when you do it about railroads? Well, the main thing that just amazes me is we've been doing this for almost 20 years now, and every time it fills up again. And you feel like surely in 20 years you've gotten everybody who's that interested in railroads, but obviously not. We've never had to cancel one in all those years. You've got people signing up for it. And we thought we could build a model. It would be up for a while. We built it as a, as a module based. So it could be taken apart. It's difficult, but it could be taken apart and stored. And you'll be happy to know that unlike uh, NCIS and uh, the lead person there, I didn't build a railroad in a building that I couldn't get it out the front door. <laughs> <laughs> And it turned out that we had to make some changes before we actually built it. The unit modules come as 36 inches wide. Well, we don't have a door that's actually 36 inches wide. We have one exit that is 35 and a half. So we ended up deciding not to go into major reconstruction of the building. And we simply cut the modules so that they were short and they were 35 inches and we'll be able to pull those out. Uh, Bill and I talked about what we were going to do, and the suggestion was in scale. Now, in scale means what? It means one foot to every 160 feet 
unless you're British, and then it's 148 to 1. But then uh, HO is 1 to 87. Well, Bill and I had both worked on 1 to 87 HO models, and we decided that let's do N scale, which is 1 to 160th, because it shortens the amount of space you have to use to depict something, and it's artistic license in any way. But you also have to uh, have rolling stock and other kinds of things you can use. Well, in scale is the second most popular railroad model. And they all had shays and climaxes at that time in HO, but in uh, in scale they had shays. These are there are three logging locomotives that were constructed in the 1880s through actually the mid 21st century. Shays, climaxes, and highlands. And so the result is is that uh, we got a, uh, two shays, and that reflects the way that this railroad was built. The first two locomotive engines the Mount Mitchell Railroad bought were shays. We have two shays. They, then they bought five climaxes. So the result is that we want, wanted to be authentic, and we decided we would build the model as it represented in 1915. 1915, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but there's a reason for that. And uh, so we started getting things and decided we'd start building it. And we also decided that we would start uh, working some of the equipment, which had to be refurbished and put together. Bill McCaskill and I no longer have 20-year-old eyes. <laughs> And it quickly became apparent that we had a problem. He knew a lot. I knew something. But we had a hard time dealing with uh, in-scale locomotives, cars, and other things. So we did what we always do, turn around and point someone and say, it's your turn. So uh, I, 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 this is where Caitlin begins to come into the picture. And uh, I thought I'd let her talk a little bit about the model and about what she had to do. One of the things that we found is that there is great attraction for this. Uh, people came from so far, uh, not just to conferences, but they have come from Virginia, they've come from Florida, all making special trips to Montreal. And one guy came up from uh, Charlotte and said he was on his way someplace and stopped by. Turns out, talking to him, he wasn't anywhere close to on his way. He diverted about 150 miles to come <laughs> visit us. So it's that kind of thing. So, Caitlin, why don't you talk about the model? And you will see in the background here uh, a video of the model and it being run uh, while she's uh, talking. There's no sound to that. So yes, uh, he called on me because I'm young, and um, <laughs> it's not the first time, like he said, I had to build that one, one trench. So whenever he first asked me to do this, I was like, great, sure. And uh, it's, it is built up literally from the ground up. So we started with these modular tables um, and had to drill them together put down plywood and it's basically just a bunch of styrofoam and construction paper with plaster covered over it. And so, oops, okay. You can see uh, it's a five, I think it's a 5% incline, is that right? Um, we have a little gadget that we set on top of it to make sure that it stay at the right thing the whole time. So I had, weirdly shaped styrofoam things that I had to file down and keep them at the right angle. Um, and so we had someone come in and take a, a video of it just because they were interested. So they put this up on YouTube and we got a capture of it. Um, you can see a little bit here and there that there's supposed to be a connection between where the Mount Mitchell Railroad starts and the Southern Railroad begins as well. Um, but I guess it, that is technically supposed to be the Southern Railroad behind me, that with the green train. Uh, it's not connected to the, the model, so it doesn't run. It's just there for looks. Um, 
And we have some more facts on display. Um, he took some video of that as well. That, I think, is the uh, spring clamp that you were talking about earlier. So some of the things that uh, Jason brought down from the mountain for us are on display. Um, so some of the uh, interesting things that we get to do at the Heritage Center is basically go through a bunch of stuff that hasn't been cataloged yet. And uh, one of the projects that we had in 2021 was a <coughs> big scanning project. We're just basically digitizing our uh, photographic collection. And um, I happened to walk down into the uh, visual artifacts room one day and pick up a box that was a glass lantern negatives that had no description on them whatsoever. And um, I just decided to go through them while I was sitting there. And I found some things that are going to be uh, shown behind me that uh, are related to the Mount Mitchell Railroad. So they're pictures that haven't been seen before. And we'll point them out whenever they come up. So some of them are the sawmill before it opened, and some train derailments, and sort of sporadic things in there. So they're, they're rare and they have You guys are lucky because most people don't get to see this kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so, so there's the train coming around the corner, and that is the junction I was talking about earlier, where we have the Southern Railroad and the Mount Mitchell Railroad, and there's some pictures that we'll see later. Um, mostly postcards, but it is a pretty long video, so I'm just going to stop that. <laughs> and you can go ahead and start with the rest. <laughs> the, um, here we go, the next one. Do you have the clicker or do I have the clicker? Uh, All right. Um, this is uh, one of the pictures. We're going to give you a little quick overview. Uh, in the 1890s, a sheep farm was occupied in where Montreal is now settled. And uh, the valley trees had been cut. So the valley part was all right. But when you started going up the sides, you had trees and uh, you had to actually do something. And logging had become a huge industry. There were many people from Pennsylvania and other places that were logging and they began to move into North Carolina in the 1870s. On a, on a modest scale. And uh, basically, uh, large-scale timber harvesting uh, began in Western North Carolina in about 1880s, early 1890s. What were they after? Well, of course, there was hardwood. <coughs> but what the people who worked on the Mount Mitchell Railroad were after were spruce and balsam. And they were looking because there was plenty of it on those slopes. And if they could get a way to get it down, there was use for it. And that use changed over time. And we'll talk about that at, during this talk. Uh, the next one is the road to Montreal. And uh, that gives you an idea of the valley and uh, how clear cut it had been. But it ended up being clear cut several times. And what, <coughs> what happened is this began to trigger off conservationists and others who were appalled at the harvesting of timber and uh, began raising questions about, was this the best thing to do? And next slide. In 1911, logging companies obtained the timber rights to large tracts of spruce and balsam forest. Uh, C.A. Dickey and J.C. Campbell obtained rights to 9,000 acres. In 1912, Dickey Campbell and Company established a large double band sawmill one mile east of Black Mountain. This mill eventually could process, with expansion over the next few years, 110,000 board feet of lumber per day. Now, in order to transport, they needed 200 million board feet of spruce and balsam down the mill. A narrow gauge railroad was built with donkeys, dynamite, and manual labor, but it needed to pass through Montreal. We'll leave that up there for a while. Uh, so the result is, is that uh, Montreal got started in 1897, and there had to be a discussion. And uh, a group got together and approached the Montreal Managing Committee in late, uh, 1911, 
And they signed the document in 1911 in November. And basically what happened is Montreat sold the land rights for the railroad. It set a fee for cutting trees and making railroad ties. And it also talked about uh, other expenses that would be paid and then ongoing. Uh, so the result is, is that it became a cash flow uh, situation which is very positive uh, when you're looking at uh, Montreat at its early days. In 1911, uh, you had had the, ta the town, municipality, had been in existence and had in 1907 been turned over to a group of Presbyterians who not first tried to convince the Senate of North Carolina to pay for Montreat. They didn't do that. But they did say that they would sell 99-year leases on property for a share. And that would allow them to uh, uh, raise capital. And of course, these shares really couldn't be sold because they weren't gen income generating shares. And so the result is, is that uh, there, was a, there was a discussion about what this value was. And we had a canny Presbyterian Scottish descendant, Robert C. Campbell, who was heading this place up. And he put in a little clause in the yellow sheet that we have mounted on the display, which basically said, if the railroad ever ceases to operate as a timber railroad for 12 months, the land reverts back to Montreal. And when indeed logging was stopped in 1920, by 1921, Montreal laid a claim to return of the right of way, which is we know as Trestle Road right now. And so the result is, is that they were went to legal courts to fight this issue, and they were upheld by the legal courts. So the result is they did it. Now, here is a picture of the, back up one, back up. This is the earliest picture we have found that we think it is unpublished. It was part of the glass lantern slides that we found in that unmarked box down in the basement of the Heritage Center. And this, if you look at it, there is the building in the center of it. It's got a power plant with two smokestacks to the right. And to the left, if you look at it carefully, and uh, it's a little difficult to see, there's nothing else built there. That's how come we know this has got to be just about the first picture of the sawmill at Black Mountain. And that would have been in, they started construction in uh, late 1911 and 1912, they completed it. And so the result was they began to uh, harvest timber. Now the next picture shows what's going on. And if you actually have, we have this picture with other crop marks, there are plenty of rail lines and buildings to the left of the uh, sawmill, which there weren't with the other picture. And you can see they've expanded the, uh, the trestle, uh, which uh, the logging flume that they would raise up on uh, chains, put it down there and it would slide down into the bandsaw area. Two bandsaws would, would do it. Um, Campbell, Robert Campbell Anderson uh, is the one who actually got the contract signed. He was aided by James D. Murphy. And uh, they had negotiated a right of way for six miles through Montreat. Now eventually this railroad went 21 miles. And uh, it was completed a little over a year. There were three trestles, which are wooden structures carrying the tracks. Shea and lumber locomotives could handle about a 5.3 grade, sometimes up to 5.9. That is huge. A regular engine with American standard rails would only do 2% increase, or maybe three, could come nowhere closer than the uh, locomotives that were narrow gauge. So in a year, they completed three trestles, nine switchbacks, 
and 18 miles of track and gained 3,500 feet in altitude. Anybody know what a switchback is? <laughs> Going back and forth, right? Well, you have to be able to take your whole train this way and then back this way. So you back half of it and go forward half of it. Makes and, big and Z's. A, Makes big Z's. But big it gets Z's. you up higher without having to climb a huge grade. And having a straight line. It's another way of, and they did nine of these uh, to get up to where they capped off the railroad, just below the summit of Mount Mitchell. And then you had to do it on the way back. It was a slow, all-day process. It would take three hours to go up uh, the six to 12 miles, depending on how far they had gotten when you came. And so the result is, is that uh, it is uh, a difficult, now this is a climax train. You think it's a climax number eight. And this is where it's got, uh, It's those big things back there in the middle, the left middle, you see a man standing on it. Those are some logs, and they were, at this level of occupation, they were still cutting chestnuts and other kinds of things until you get to um, the firs and the balsams. Um, at two o'clock in the morning one, one day, we were building this. I woke up, which is not unusual. There's a few people up in my tree this time, and John, uh, Hinkle and I you know, just could talk to each other if we wanted to. Uh, and um, I suddenly had a thought. And uh, my thought was, I wonder what elevation above sea level firs grow. And the reason that was important is we were trying to do this model to be reasonably accurate. And I found out the answer the next day, 4,200 feet. Well, my tree doesn't get to 4,200 feet, and, and the mountains around here on their way to 6,500 feet don't clear that marker until uh, after they pass through Montreal. Well, Bill McCaskill had 200 spruces, and we wanted to plan in this model. So I arbitrarily decided that climate warming had occurred in that time. <laughs> and it was still, would freeze over the lake in Montreal. So obviously, the elevation was lower in 1915 than it is in 19, 2010, and therefore I could use the 200 uh, spruces. This is the first company that ran what would become known as the Mount Mitchell Railroad. And this is a Dickey and Campbell that I mentioned earlier. And uh, this is a, an engineer and a fireman. Now, after Dickey and Campbell, they were bought by somebody, and I'm gonna have Caitlin tell you about the second company to own parts of the Mount River. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this is an article in the newspaper in basically talking about the transaction between Dickey and Campbell and uh, Crowley and Crockett. They're the new owners in 1913. So whenever the sawmill actually started to run, it was about mm, August, I think, August of 1913, and the, uh, the owners, Dickey and Campbell, had already kind of overextended themselves financially, so they only owned it for about two months before they sold it to these guys, Crowley and Crockett. And um, it, the article actually gives a pretty good uh, explanation of what the sawmill itself had. 
Um, so I'll just read a little bit here. It says, there is a large double band mill that was built on the Southern Railroad line near Black Mountain and logs conveyed there by means of logging cars pulled by Climax engines. The work necessitated the use of six locomotives, 70 logging cars, two loaders, and two steam skidders. Over 30 teams of horses, as well as 200 men, are used at the labor camps. It is the intention of the new firm to increase the capacity of the mill to 110,000 feet of lumber per day. It is said that there is enough lumber in the neighborhood of Mount Mitchell to require over 12 years of cutting, which did not happen. But uh, 18 miles of that road has already now been completed, and it will reach over 40 miles by the time the forests are clear. Uh, and that was incorrect as well. So it only ever extended to about 21 miles, which is too around the summit of Mount Mitchell. Um, and here's where we get to where the passenger car tourism part comes in. It says that they, uh, <laughs> part of Pearlie and Crockett's intentions of buying this sawmill was to start uh, the passenger car railroad. Um, so that was supposed to be a drawing point for Black Mountain. That's kind of something that helps build up the economy at the time. And um, one of the things that you'll probably see several times during the presentation is that they're always mentioning that Mount Mitchell is the highest point east of the Rockies. They want you to know that. Uh, it's definitely one of the greatest scenes in the world. And there's always, it's very flowery language. So, which is true, it really is very pretty. Um, and one of the things I, personally noticed whenever I was putting the presentation together with the, uh, the landscape, even though a lot of these pictures are in black and white, it's beautiful. It really is beautiful. So they are right. <laughs> but uh, that was uh, pretty much the gist of what that article is. So the next slide has a, uh, a picture of Pearlie. He's the guy on the left, and he was the, uh, ran the, the mill operations. And the guy on the right, Crockett, dealt with mostly the lumber. So, there's not much to say about him. Um, this is a postcard uh, that kind of has a little bit, you can probably barely see, there's a line going up the mountain there. Uh, it's supposed to be showing you the route of the Mount Mitchell Railroad. So it's about a mile east of downtown Black Mountain. This is where the sawmill was located right around where the tractor supply is today. Um, and so it goes up Brooks Cove onto Rainbow Mountain, and it goes from Rainbow Gap into Montreat, running up Lookout, and some of the stops along the way are Sourwood Gap, and uh, Graybeard Pinnacle, all the way up to the base, well, the summit of Mount Mitchell where they have Camp Alice. Um, and so, like you said, it was about 3,500 feet uh, in, in uh, elevation and uh, 21 miles. So they didn't get to the 40 miles that they anticipated or really wanted to. Um, and there are three trestles and nine switchbacks, like you said. So this picture is another postcard, and it's not the actual original photo, but you'll see that later on in the presentation. Um, this is. It's been identified as Rainbow Gap, but there is a little bit of debate on whether or not it's Rainbow Gap or Sarwood Gap. Um, and the original photo actually are not passenger cars, it's livestock cars. Um, so they're just trying to make it look pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, I think, Slady. Uh, if I'm saying that right. This is a view uh, along the way of Slady. And I think this is Camp Alice. Yes, this is Camp Alice. So whenever the uh, passenger car starts running, they set up kind of a, a station at the top of the hill for people to get off. So you have about, I think, 250 people per day that would make the trip up the mountain. And it was about three and a half hours to get up there with all the switchbacks. Wow. And um, they had four hours to hang out on the top of the mountain. Uh, you could have dinner at Camp Alice. You could stay overnight if you wanted to. Um, and then you'd make your trip back down. And <laughs> it'd be another three and a half hours. So it's a whole day, a 
whole day. I think I would be a one and done and I wouldn't do it again. <laughs> That's exhausting. Um, and uh, this is a, a picture from, you can see the sawmill in the background. Uh, this is the passenger car uh, station. So there were two, um, there was a junction, like I mentioned earlier, where the Southern Railroad uh, came alongside the Mount Mitchell Railroad. And they never actually met together in terms of the line itself. So they would have people coming from Asheville or anywhere. Uh, and you would get off the Southern Railroad, so Southern Railroad walk down the stairs to this stop here at the Mount Mitchell uh, station and take that train all the way up to the top. Um, and here's a, another postcard as an example. You can see the Southern Railroad line coming in and uh, there's just off to the, the bottom there, it says Mount Mitchell Railroad on the top of that little white sign. And then you walk down the stairs. <laughs> And uh, the, the passenger car uh, thing, it started in 1913, but they didn't dedicate the uh, station until 1915. So they had it running for a couple of years before they actually got around to the whole grand opening thing, which is, which is typical. Um, and here's a picture of the Mount Mitchell Railroad from the bottom. So this is the other side of what we just saw where people are taken off to go to the top. And there's both of the trains at the same time. So these are all postcards. And I tried to add them because I wanted to have some color for the, the slideshow, because otherwise it's just black and white and it can be a little boring. So that's the best I could do for you guys. <laughs> um, uh, and then now we talk about the, uh, the actual uh, Tickets and scenery and stuff. This Vermont can do that. The greatest mountain <laughs> scenic railroad in the globe. <laughs> <laughs> I've done some PR in my day, but that's pretty good. <laughs> the in eight in August 1915, the round trip fare from Asheville with the change into Black Mountain Scenic Railroad was two dollars and fifty cents. Uh, they began taking passengers on an experimental basis in 1913, and they uh, later, uh, in 1914, became basically a very big promoter of it, and uh, they did so until 1917, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide is they did all kinds of things to try and promote uh, the railroad. Sandy. Uh, We hired a person to take care of just doing merchant, uh, marketing and merchandise, and uh, this is one of the booklets. We have two booklets in the uh, Heritage Center. These are pictures from the next page. It shows one of the pages where they take real pictures, glue them into this booklet, and then they would have an eight-page, say for example, souvenir that I'm sure they tried to sell. But uh, the passengers could take back with them, and these are, like I say, individual pictures. Now there is an end to this, and it has a list of points of interest, and this is a point of interest in a list. Now, one of the questions we had and we knew was that Montreat had a stop for the Mount Mitchell Railroad. So I said, let's go find it. We worked about six months doing research, trying to find where the Montreat station stop was. We went to the managing reports of the MRA. We took a look at railroad reports. We took a look at uh, all kinds of materials, articles, uh, booklets, etc. And we had some pretty good researchers working at it. We never found documentary evidence of a Mount of a Montreal Rail Station on the Mount Mitchell Railroad. There were, there were four places you could get on it, though I understand from people who were old enough when I first started doing this. 
unfortunately, most of them are gone. But according to them, there were four different places that if you were standing there, they would stop and pick you up. I don't know if they were real stations. And that, that was right, did you hear that? There were people who said there were four different places you could get on. She wasn't sure that they were a, mission, a actual station, but that uh, there was a way to get on and off. Well, Caitlin was working on this presentation, and we've had these booklets out under vitrine glass. And they, of course, show the pictures, not the back of the book. Caitlin came to me and said, There it is. I said, what? And this says, on the second, the first group of things is Rainbow Gap, and then Point Lookout, and indented it says, Montreat Station. <laughs> Sometimes you don't have to be good, apparently, to find that information. And, uh, it took us a long time to read what was obviously uh, information in our possession that we did not know that we had. And so uh, we were proud to pronounce that the official exit entry point for Montreat was the Montreat Station. And uh, Robert Campbell Anderson, I'm sure, made money, I know that for a fact, <laughs> on tickets that were sold in Montreat to capture this so it was something else. Did y'all uh, read the others? Pardon me? The others? Oh, yeah, sure. The others are Sunny Mountain, Sawwood Gap, Old Fort in the uh, distance, so it's not in Montreal, <laughs> Little and Big Slady, Mill Creek Spring, Old Mount Mitchell Trail, Crossing Blue Ridge, Pinnacle, Andrews Geyser, which is listed in that. Of course, it's not Montreal, that's down at the foot of the mountain. But you can see it from apparently Mount Mitchell. Uh, Greybeard, dividing ocean and Gulf waters. In effect, the continental divide. <laughs> First view of Mount Mitchell. I don't know why they didn't say second view of Mount Mitchell, but uh, Craggy in the distance, Asheville watershed, Table Rock, Tennessee, Grandfather Mountain, Tennessee, Klingman's Peak, Potato Knob. Mount Mid, uh, Mitchell Ridge in distant, Black Brothers in distance, Black Stock Knob. Photos by Barnhill, <laughs> who's a famous photographer here in uh, Black Mountain and has taken many pictures. Now, the next uh, image shows an excursion, and uh, the gentleman standing there on the uh, right, I think, is. Um, not per uh, it's not pearly, it's, uh, yeah, Crockett, I think it's Crockett. What it, how about either the standards or writing? We've got it down someplace. It's, I was having a senior moment, which is not surprising. This is identified in the exhibit, and the lady to his left is the future business. Yes, we have that in the exhibit, and you're right. I thought it was pearly, but I could be wrong. It might be pearly. The next one shows a switchback. You can see the train, passenger cars, there is a, a, a line there, it can come up and go back and be climbing, or it can come back down the mountain. And, and uh, that's what a switchback actually looks like. Did someone have to get out and switch the track? To the yes, yes. And, and there was no mechan uh, automatic switch, it was this labor pushing the rail over. The next slide shows a close-up of the passengers going around the trestle. That's one of the trestles, and there's another uh, picture which shows the YMCA at a convention in Asheville. They came in mass to uh, the Mount Mitchell Ra Railroad, and this is them all going up uh, towards, uh, towards the summit of the, uh, the mountain, the highest point east of the Rockies. The next slide shows the same gap on the trail shot in probably 1917 or so, and then shot in the 80s. And you can see very little has changed, but you, you can do that. And I understand, that Joe, uh, do you know where that picture was taken? Yeah, what? 
between halfway between Lookout and Sourwood. So halfway between Lookout and Sourwood? Right. The picture on the left, when I found it, was labeled coming down from a wreck. They evidently had a wreck and everybody was having to walk home. <laughs> Did you hear that? Next slide is a wreck. <laughs> Good transition. And, and by the way, we're constantly looking for new information. History is not locked in stone. It awaits the next discovery that adds more to your knowledge base. But here is probably a climax engine that has flipped over. And uh, train derailments we found were actually fairly common. Uh, whether it was the land or the movement of the rocks or the rails or other kinds of things, uh, it wasn't unusual for wrecks to occur. Now, most wrecks had a tendency to be just simply jumping the track. This has jumped the track but done a little more damage than you think, but uh, it's uh, possible. The next slide is one of the mystery glass slides we found in the box, unidentified. It shows the crew, it's difficult to see, but in the center of the picture, in the uh, white, it looks like a little up and down, that's the crew working, and that's where it derailed, and then coming down about 50 feet, you can see parts of the locomotive and things. Major derailments were fairly unusual, and we think this probably dates more from about uh, 15 or 16. And that's based upon some records we found about wreckage that has occurred and we're noted. But of course, we have the right to uh, adjust that if we can. Now, uh, we've got some other pictures that were found, and then Caitlin, as a, as a discoverer, gets to talk about them. Okay. Let me see if this. Oh, I okay, can many. Okay. Um, so, this is at the top of the Mount Mitchell to have a the passenger train has come to its stop, and uh, up those stairs would be Camp Alice. So you can kind of see around it a little bit that some of the trees are gone. Um, it's been clearly logged, up, <laughs> logged out. And the train itself is empty. So people are out and about doing whatever it is that they want to do on the top of Mitchell for the day. Um, and here's a, a temporary memorial marker for Elisha Mitchell, the guy who discovered uh, highest peak east of the Rockies. Um, it's just temporary because I, I believe that the story was whenever uh, there was a there was a permanent one and it got destroyed somehow. So they put up something temporary and um, on it, you can't read it, but it says that a permanent one is going to be put up by the state of North Carolina eventually. And uh, the next one is just a picture of the tower that's on the top of Mount Mitchell. And I think it's kind of funny because you can see the women at the bottom of the, the tower, and the men on the very, very top on the roof doing something dumb. So, <laughs> um, I just thought that was, uh, was kind of amusing. And then, of course, there's some men with their children hanging on off the side of the, the tower there. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then we have National Geographic did an article on it in 1920. So before he comes up here and says anything, this picture on the right is the one I was talking about earlier where they had the postcard that made it look pretty. And this is the original photo that has the livestock animals and the men standing on top of the train doing something smart. They had Photoshop in 1920. <laughs> um, the reason we found mention, there's, there's very few books on the Mount Mitchell Railroad. Most of them, if they mention this at all, say in July 1920, the uh, Mount Mitchell Railroad is pictured in, in uh, National Geographic. Well, we went looking, we always double checked, so we went looking for this issue. And I looked at it, and I have a collection that goes back to 1916, but we won't talk about that because it's a sore point with my life. National Geographic collection over the 20th century. But it wasn't in July. So we went looking for it. We found it in August of 1920. Now, what's interesting to me is that this was a series of articles written by National Geographic that looks at the, Ameri the origins of American states. 
and they went to each state and they would find some article to talk about the state, etc., and then find a representative picture of that state. Well, the Mount Mitchell Railroad started in 1911, became logging in 1912. By 1918, the federal government had stepped in and said, stop taking passengers to Mount Mitchell because they wanted lumber for airplanes in World War I. You wanted lightweight spruce and uh, balsams that were uh, very hard and very uh, useful, and of course they didn't weigh as much, and then the U.S. was in the process of building a great armada of model airplanes, biplanes, triplanes, all the things that we used in World War I. So the result is, is they got this uh, done, and the district, and like uh, Caitlin said, they changed the image that went with it. Now the National Geographic used the original image, which shows it being a uh, industrial car, if you will, uh, or, and uh, three men sitting on top of sort of the viewpoint of it being converted into uh, uh, passenger service. Now, when all logging operations stopped in 1920, the successor company to the Mount Mitchell Railroad decided to build a motor road to Mount Mitchell for people to go as opposed to a railroad. The scenic road has exhausted the English vocabulary in a feeble attempt of describing the wonderful engineering feat and scenic grandeur. Well, the Mount Mitchell Motor uh, Company basically had to move its initial operation to the other side of the bridge because this side was Montreal property and the property reverted back to Montreal. So it went through Ridgecrest. So that's why if you go on the Montreal side, Trestle Roads, etc., on the map, you're in the old original railroad bed. The stuff that's over the ridge there in Ridgecrest, etc., that they had to build to replace the Montreal activity. Let's see. What's the next slide? Oh, this is one of the paths, and you want to do the next one? That's Camp Alice. Alice was originally just a dining room and tents you could stay in. Later they added uh, larger dining facilities, and this is the motor, ray, motor road uh, result where people drove up in the morning and they came back. Um, Ron, yes. may I make a, yes. um, that I have several people scattered about this <laughs> audience who are experts on my mental No, but I've always been struck by the fact that that probably was one of the first motels anywhere. Oh, that's um, very interesting. They, they did have some lodging above the, cafe, the dining room, mm -hmm. but really that was where most people stayed that wanted to stay. And, it looks like a motel to me. <laughs> Good Why idea. Why did they call it the commissary? The ridge because the, a lot of the workers stay up there. And the workers in the, the commissary, in the, the dining room. Well, we talked about railroad ties. We talked about the price. I think we covered. Did we not cover a topic that we did identified earlier? I, I would like to say one more thing. There were a couple of years that it was the number one tourist attraction in the United States. I don't know if you were going to say that. I don't yeah. want to. But yeah. it actually got more people than Niagara Falls. Which was <laughs> stunning. And uh, it exposed a lot of people to Western North Carolina, which certainly probably helped in eventual uh, economic uh, growth. This is the Heritage Center has several objectives. It is to talk about the history and heritage of the Reform faith, Presbyterian and Reformed churches. It is to identify worldwide missions. It is to talk about the history of Western North Carolina. We feel like we've made some progress in talking about the history of North Carolina with the Mount Mitchell Railroad. We thank you for your attention and it's refreshment time. <laughs> Judy, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you both of you. That was very creative, very interesting. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out also is Ron and staff have been doing this every single year for this organization, which we call the Montreal Adult Summer Club. We go to Ron and say, okay, what do you want to do it on this summer? And it'll normally be something tied into something else that's going on, an anniversary or what, whatever. And I just want to personally thank Ron for these years. And Ron is retiring at the end of this year. So I think an ovation. Okay. He is a hard worker, and that won't stop. There's no telling when he's got a little bit more time what he'll be thinking of. We will, he'll be around, trust me. Okay, uh, we talked a little bit about next week. So next week is our covered dish picnic, and it's in Gaither Fellowship Hall. And listen up. It is at 6 o'clock. There's been a little bit of debate. Is it 5 o'clock? Is it 6 o'clock? It's at 6 o'clock. Right, Amy Blake? 6 o'clock tomorrow at Gaither Fellowship Hall. Um, so uh, bring uh, food to share. Invite your neighbors. It's really a fun time. And the bonus this year is, I hope many of you know Walter Somerville, and he is going to be talking, Amy calls it a whimsical and fascinating program on the guinea fowl. And if you know Walter at all, you know he's big on the guinea. And if you've been in town hall, you'll see the guinea portrait is in there. So we will hear more about that. I think this is going to be a fascinating evening from a fascinating guy. So I hope you'll be there next week and bring your neighbors. Drinks will be provided, but bring food. <laughs> okay, um, also at the back we have tickets being sold to the Montreal Adult Summer, no, it's not right, at the Presbyterian Heritage Center Tour of Homes. And let me just put a plug in. The booklet is well worth your buying a ticket. It is a wonderful booklet that Mari Grambling and her crowd have come up with. It is very good, very in-depth about North Carolina Terrace, and the history and the stories that go with it. It's going to be a keepsake. Uh, the tour is that a lot of people have worked really hard on this. So if you don't have your ticket, I'll have mine. If you don't have your ticket, somebody's selling over there. There we are. They're selling over there. Uh, you're not going to want to miss it. It really, really is going to be good. We had it last year. Don't know if this will be next year also, but we're you know, we'll look forward to it. Um, now, at the back, Beth Frith, if y'all don't know Beth Frith and her background, her culinary background, she's, actually her career was in food. She used to own a bakery. She's really good at this stuff, and she's got a lot of people with her back there, and I even see some little train things on the table. So that's your treat, and all the people this year who have made fabulous treats for us um, after our program. So be sure and thank them. Uh, let me see what else she told me to do. Um, one last thing that I want to do is to indicate that these things don't just happen. These programs don't just happen. 
I don't know if you noticed there was a lot of creative publicity this year. Everywhere you turn, it's like summer club uh, programs, that sort of thing. It doesn't just happen. Amy Blake, thank you. All of us, thank you. <laughs> I'm not surprised. She is acknowledging that Mason Blake may have done a thing or two this week for this also. Uh, okay, so thanks again to you two, how wonderful that was, and to all of the helpers out here that really added a lot to it, and to Bill McCaskill for getting all this started. If you've not seen the exhibit that they keep talking about, you really need to get over to the Presbyterian Heritage Center and see that. So thank you for coming, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.